he's going to talk about um, effective DRAM cohomology. Peter. Yeah, okay, thank you, Shagata, for this uh, introduction. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, research, which I've been doing actually uh, more than 10 years of ago already. <laughs> Um, the reason why this was published so late was that the, 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 the whole process kind of, um, I don't know, got stuck somewhere. First, I um, submitted it to a couple of journals, or I, first, I didn't know where to submit it because um, usually I work in algorithms and complexity, and um, so the, the usual journals I submit to were journals who were interested in algorithms and complexity. And um, this result actually does not give an algorithm for computing the cohomology or anything. Um, it's just about degree bounds. And so um, they were not interested and uh, was looking for other uh, journals. And then, um, yeah, finally in the transaction, no, sorry, in the communications, um, I submitted it, I, I looked it up and I submitted it at uh, 2014. And then um, I got the answer in two, 2017. And it took uh, a new, another year or so until it was published. So this is just um, a side remark. Okay, effective RAM cohomology. What it is, is it about? Um, I want to, Talk a little bit about of uh, a little bit about this question and uh, its motivation, previous um, known results, and now the uh, result of uh, my paper. And I want to kind of um, yeah give ideas of the proof, um, which has as a main part um, the Giesin sequence, um, and I will try to explain it a little bit. So what is the RAM cohomology? You probably know. Um, we have a, so if we have a smooth affine variety, let, so over the complex numbers, let's say, um, yeah. Um, so for me, an, a variety is, um, not necessarily irreducible. So it's um, just an algebraic set. And I present here everything over the complex numbers, but it works actually over any uh, field, algebraically closed field. Okay, but of course this, com this uh, statement here of Grotendieck uh, uh, requires the complex numbers. It, and it says that the usual singular cohomology of the variety uh, can be described algebraically in terms of differential forms. And um, this is called the algebraic Dirac cohomology, which is um, the cohomology of the sheaf of differential forms on X. Algebraic differential forms. So the coefficients um, are polynomials or polynomial functions on X. So a typical um, differential form has this representation. So the omegas here are um, regular functions. And then you have this differentials of the variables uh, and wedge products of them. Now, um, this means that, that every cohomology class here can be represented by um, one of those differential forms, modulo the exact forms. And um, question is, how large do we have to take the degree of these functions which are represented by polynomials? So in particular, I want to have a bound which um, depends on uh, the degree of the variety and uh, the number of indeterminates or similar um, quantities. So typically in, in the area of uh, computational algebraic geometry, um, you, you would like to have single exponential um, 
bounds in terms of the degrees of the defining equations for x. But of course, if, if you want to um, formulate it more um, independently of the defining def the equations, you, you rather talk about the degree of the variety, which is, um, in my definition, just the sum over all degrees of all the irreducible uh, components of X. There is also different kinds of uh, different variants of this notion. Okay, and um, yeah, it turns out that um, actually here n is mentioned, the number of indeterminates, um, and it turns out that we can have a, a bound which is independent of n, but only depends on p when we describe the pth uh, cohomology and um, the dimension of the variety. So why are we interested in this uh, question? Um, of course, if you want to compute the cohomology, it might be relevant to have a degree bound um, if you want to yeah, compute the, the RAM cohomology. Um, I want to stress here that uh, it is not, not sufficient to have an, a degree bound here. And um, so uh, to have a, it's not sufficient for uh, having an algorithm because um, yeah, cohomology is defined by exact forms modulo, uh, sorry, closed forms modulo exact forms. And you also have to control the, um, the exact forms. So that means if you have a form which you know it is exact, um, you somehow have to describe it. And the naive approach is that you try to describe it in terms of a pre-image of the differential. And so um, the degree of this pre-image is um, crucial here. And it really turns out that this question is really the hard part. And it's, uh, it's really unsolved uh, as of now. Okay. But anyway, it is one uh, question which is relevant for algorithmic questions. Then actually the reason why I considered this was a question of uh, Sergei Yakovenko, who and um, his colleagues uh, have solved um, uh, the so-called infinitesimal Hilbert 16th problem, which deals uh, with certain kind of um, abelian integrals. And uh, he was asking this question because he wanted to um, generalize their results. Okay. Also, I wanted to um, mention that um, I use the term effective maybe a little bit differently than other people do. Uh, what I mean when I say effective is that um, I have a degree bound and sometimes also other bounds like a bound on the order of things. Um, but often the term effective means that uh, you have an algorithm and this is not what I am intending to, um, to say with that. Okay, so what are known cases or what were known cases before this work? Um, so the problem actually is that uh, if you have an affine variety, which is smooth, um, then the projective closure of it um, might have singularities. And, um, but if this is not the case, so if the projective closure is smooth, then um, actually everything is quite fine and we can uh, really uh, calculate the Durham cohomology actually in single exponential time uh, using bounds for all the objects which occur on the way. And um, this work um, implies that we have a degree bound on the um, representatives of the cohomology classes of this type and n to the power of three times d, the degree of the variety. So uh, that's uh, from the paper 
which uses mainly the tool of uh, Castel Novo Mumford regularity. Then there's another special case which seems quite restricted, but that is actually the core of the problem. Uh, this this bound here, which I mentioned, is um, due to Delinier and Dimka, and um, Griffiths has also uh, res partial results uh, already 69. So now the this is the setting of a principal open set, so the complement of a hypersurface, which is of course also an affine variety. So you can uh, describe it globally by uh, differential forms. And um, so every cohomology class is represented by a differential forms, a form which looks like this, alpha divided, divided by some power of f, if f is the defining equation of the hypersurface. Um, and in this projective, well, Okay, first I should maybe mention um, the original setting here in the linear and Dimka is uh, the proje projective setting. So we have the projective space um, minus a hypersurface. And then in those differential forms actually have degree zero in the sense that um, the degree of a differential forms with a form with a, with a denominator is the difference of the degrees of the numerator and denominator. Um, so here I formulate this bound in the affine setting, which um, requires some, like a, a very simple uh, step to reduce it to the projective case. And this um, makes this degree different from zero. So actually uh, the, uh, the numerator alpha has degree P times the degree of F plus one. So this is um, really, uh, yeah, I would say quite a deep result. And um, also in this setting, so the linear and Dimka, they have studied um, closed forms. So if omega is a closed form um, and you want to represent it as a different, uh, di uh, as the um, differential of some other form, eta, uh, what, what degree can eta have? And it turns out that um, only in very restricted cases they can even prove a bound. And um, it may also be that, I mean, they can, pr I think they can uh, prove the existence of a bound, just the pure existence of a bound. Uh, but it is not clear if it only depends on these parameters we usually use, which is the degree of f and the number of variables and so on. So it might happen, it might be the case that uh, the degree bound actually depends on the coefficients of f, for instance, in some way, I don't know. So this is not even clear yet. And of course, uh, their proof of the existence of, a, um, of such a bound um, uses resolution of singularities, and uh, it is known that the complexity of this um, is very bad. Okay, anyway, here we do not consider closed forms, sorry, exact forms, only closed forms. Um, and uh, we will use this bound here in the proof of um, the general result. So I call this uh, the GDD bound, Griffith, Delinear, Dimka. Okay, so here just uh, some notation. Um, the degree of uh, a differential form is defined as, um, the degree, uh, yeah, just taking into account also the differentials having degree one. And just as an abbreviation, um, so the we write D of uh, the RAM cohomology if, um, so for the smallest uh, integer, so that uh, every cohomology class can be represented by a p form of that degree. Now our results is our the result is this that the degree of uh, the pth Ram cohomology is bounded by p times d to the power of 
O of PM. So here P is uh, the degree of the differential and uh, D is the degree of the variety, M is the dimension. So N, the number of ambient dimensions is not occurring here. Okay, I should mention, so I've, I first looked at the case of a hypersurface. If, if X is a hypersurface, then um, you can have a, a slightly improved bound. You don't, don't need the P in the exponent here. Okay, let's um, look into the ideas of the proof. So what is the structure of the proof? Um, you can divide it in two major steps. The first step is a reduction of the problem to the case of a um, locally closed hypersurface. So as I said, as uh, an, a variety in my uh, setting may be, irre may be reducible. So a first reduce to the case of irreducible um, variety. And um, this is made by in terms of um, kind of an effective version of uh, the irreducible decomposition, or actually it's the decomposition into connected components. Uh, but which of course is the same in the smooth case. Um, so you can you, you can def, you can construct idempotence of the polynomial so of the um, coordinate ring of X um, for those varieties. So the idempotence are just functions which are one at one of the components and zero on the other ones. And using the effective Hilbert Nullstern sets you can um, really construct them and control their degrees. And using this, you can easily um, extend degree bounds for the xi's um, to degree bounds for x. Now, if you have an irreducible variety, uh, it's known that it is birational to a hypersurface. And um, this means that. Uh, dense open subset of X is actually isomorphic to a dense open subset of a hypersurface. So um, since you have to cut out something um, in this birational, in this birationality uh, statement, you, um, you need to, and you want to get everything of X, you need to cover X by um, principal open sets. And each of them, each of those UIs are then actually isomorphic to locally closed hypersurfaces. Um, this is done basically by the construction of a geometric resolution, which is kind of a standard um, construction in computational algebraic geometry. Um, you have an irreducible variety of dimension M, and then you take a generic subspace of one dimension higher, and you project onto the subs um, subspace. And um, if it's in general position, then you get a hypersurface as an image. And this is then uh, the hypersurface defined by Fi. And, um, to get a, yeah, an isomorphism, you have to cut out um, a certain sub variety, which is defined actually by a partial derivative of, of this fi. So this should be fi here. So that's the geometric resolution, and you can. So this is a, this is well known, and uh, there's a degree bounds for those um, constructions for the polynomials and stuff. So this is um, not the problem. But then um, when you want to um, carry over degree bounds for those UIs, for those um, patches, if you want to uh, use those bounds to get bounds for X, then of course you need to do more. And um, actually what you do is you use hypercomology 
for that, you need to know that the Durham cohomology in general is defined as a hypercohomology. Only in the affine case, you can describe um, is, can describe it by global sections of the, the RAM complex. Um, and if you do this patching here, then you actually have to work with hypercohomology. And um, since we want to do everything effective, that means we want to really uh, carry over degree bounds. Uh, we have to um, really explicitly construct all the things which you have to do um, in the proofs. So uh, the basic work, much of this work was um, to go through all those uh, standard proofs of the uh, spectra sequences and stuff like that and check cohomology and to, to uh, trace the degrees of the uh, constructed objects. So this has uh, been done. It's not actually very hard, but it's uh, cumbersome. I mean, it's uh, quite complex. You have to go through a lot of proofs and so on. Um, but this can be done. And then um, you can reduce actually to the case of the UIs, which is actually described by some locally closed hypersurface of the type VI. So how, you, how do you treat those? So uh, let's look at it. You have the zero set of a polynomial F uh, minus the zero set of G. And um, we need it in a little bit more general setting. So uh, the pa some partial derivative of f um, divides g. This is just because of the, the patching. You need to uh, multiply some of the g's we had there together. And then um, we have a setting like this. OK, so again, a standard trick is that you um, represent the complement of a hypersurface as um, an, a closed affine variety introducing a new variable. So uh, the complement of Z of G can be um, represented by this polynomial G times X zero minus one with an additional variable X zero. And then if you intersect that with uh, the zero set of F in this higher dimensional affine space, then you get Z, and this is um, this is um, isomorphic. So you are in the case of a um, complete intersection of co-dimension two. But actually, not any or an arbitrary uh, complete intersection, but of this special type. This is um, this is really important for proofs. Proof. I don't know if um, I would be able to prove a corresponding result uh, for general F0 and general F1. Okay, the main tool to handle now this complete intersection is the Giesin sequence. The Giesin sequence, I will talk about this a little bit later uh, more, um, but it, it uh, implies that in our setting, uh, we have an isomorphism between two um, the RAM cohomologies of Z and of its complement. So here you have a shift of three. And uh, we will see later why. And um, so also um, the major part of the proof now is to make this uh, isomorphism effective, meaning that uh, you can carry over degree bounds for the corresponding differential forms. But you have to be careful. Um, the complement of Z is not affine. So you, the, the RAM cohomology on the left-hand side here is not described by global sections, but it is indeed a hyper cohomology. OK, but you can uh, cover. Um, this open set with uh, two open sets, U0, Z1, uh, U1, which are actually the complements of the hypersurfaces F0, F1. And um, using this covering, you can yeah, describe the cohomology in terms of hypercomology. Now you def 
you actually are left with a case of UI or more precisely also with intersections of them. Um, and for that, we can now apply the GDD bound I mentioned before, and um, then yeah, do the patching again with, with hypercomology to, to get a description of the, uh, the RAM cohomology of the complement of Z. And uh, then carry over to, to Z and so on. And this is actually the major um, work in this, in this proof. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the Giesin sequence. In general, um, it's the following. You have a smooth irreducible variety X and a sub variety of uh, co-dimension R, Z, and we assume that it's at least equidimensional. Then um, there's an exact sequence, which you see here. It's the pth theorem cohomology of X, which maps to the pth theorem cohomology of the complement of Z in X. And then you have the connecting homomorphism, which is a residue map. And we will talk a lot about this uh, map then. Um, and it maps to the, the RAM cohomology here of the degree P minus 2R plus 1 of Z. And then you map again to the P plus 1, uh, P plus first uh, cohomology of X. And if uh, the cohomology of X is trivial, which is the case, of course, if X is an affine space here, then um, the resi residue map is an isomorphism. And this is the isomorphism I mentioned before. So this is um, true for all smooth equidimensional varieties of some codimension. And uh, in our case, we have codimension two, R is equal to two. So this gives the P minus three here. Okay, I, um, let me give you a very trivial example, the case n equal to one, one variable polynomial, just to um, give you an idea what the residue map is or yeah, how it looks like and where, where it comes from, um, because it's well known in this case. If you have a univariate polynomial f over complex numbers, you can factorize it in linear factors. So the zero set is just a bunch of points, of course. And the partial fraction decomposition says that the, or implies that the um, first Durham cohomology of the complement of those, this bunch of points is um, generated by this basis here, dx, the differential of the one variable divided by x minus zeta i, so a linear factor of f. And this, um, all, or on the other hand, um, you can also look at the zero theorem cohomology of the zero set itself, which is uh, just a bunch of points. Um, so the dimension is given, or is just the number of points. And the idempotents, which are given here, which are actually Lagrange interpolation polynomials, um, they, define the basis of this space. And actually the, the residual map here from H1 of the complement to H0 of the uh, zero set uh, can be described as this. So you have a, a rational function G divided by F to the S times DX. This is a, an, a representative of a cohomology class here. And this maps to the residual times the uh, idempotent EI and the sum over those. So the residual at each of the points. Um, and this is actually really the classical residual, um, which is the, the, the coefficient of the, yeah, 
of uh, x minus zeta to the minus one in the Laurent series expansion around this zeta. Now, our residue is just a generalization of this. Okay, so the Giesen uh, sequence, of course, was known. It was, um, it was um, proved by Hartshorn. At least he gave an uh, algebraic proof. It was probably known before and proved before. Um, and um, the goal here now is to make it effective so that we can really control the degrees of the, um, actually, of the behavior of the residue map. Okay, here's again our setting. We uh, abbreviate the polynomial ring uh, by A, now in N plus one variables. So X zero was the additional variable. We have our two special polynomials, F one and F zero. So F one is just the polynomial in just the N variables, which was given. And um, F zero is the yeah, polynomial describing the complement of G. And we assume that the partial derivative of F with respect to Xn say divides G. Then actually we have a smooth complete intersection of co-dimension two. And um, the two polynomials F0, F1 actually generate the vanishing ideal of this variety. So the um, coordinate ring is A modulo this ideal. So we have a really convenient uh, situation. But note that the complement of it is not affine. So W is not affine. And um, to describe the Durham cohomology, we need hyper cohomology. And this is kind of a huge object. However, um, here we have not the worst situation because uh, Z is a complete intersection and this allows us to describe the Durham cohomology also in a different way. And this is uh, described in this uh, lemma here. So the P plus first uh, Durham cohomology of W is actually isomorphic to this, which is the pth cohomology of the, the first um, sheaf cohomology of um, w with um, coefficients in, in the omega in the differentials. And uh, more specifically, we can, one can describe this uh, like this. It's the pth cohomology of this complex here. It's um, the complex of Keller differentials of this ring here, A localized at the product F0, F1. And you divide out um, the, the sum of the Keller differentials uh, for the rings A um, localized at F0 and localized at F1 respectively. So this uh, isomorphism holds for all non-negative P. So note that for the zeroth Durham cohomology here of W is not described this way, but um, this doesn't matter because the zeroth uh, Durham cohomology of the complement of a variety is anyway a trivial. I mean, it's a one dimensional, so we don't have to deal with it actually. Okay, now here's the uh, result for this um, residue map. We use now this description I just mentioned. And um, so the, the residue map here from HP plus one of W to HP minus two of Z um, can actually be described by a map uh, which in this representation here, in this description, um, yeah, it maps an element, a represent, an element represented by an element of, of this numerator here. Um, so it's a, it's a P form with a coefficients in the localization of A 
um, with respect to the product polynomial f0, f1. So it's a, it's a form of this type, alpha divided by some power of f0, f1, where um, yeah, alpha is actually an, a form on, uh, with coefficients in A. Okay, um, so each cohomology class in this uh, de uh, domain of definition of this residue map uh, is represented by such an omega. And then uh, the image here in the cohomology of Z, it's obviously represented by a usual polynomial um, differential form. And uh, this has degree, or it can be represented by a degree Probably not by, by degree form, by form with um, degree like this here. So we have uh, the, the degrees of the po describing polynomials, F0, F1, and then in the exponent here, we have S, uh, which is the order of this form. And then of course, uh, the degree of alpha itself um, also enters. Okay, I try to uh, sketch the proof of this uh, sequence, and um, this is also how the proof of um, of the bounds work. Uh, you go through the uh, proofs, the proof of the Giesen sequence and all the constructions, and uh, you trace the the objects, and in particular the degrees of the objects you create. Okay, you can define the following map lambda, which uh, kind of goes in reverse direction. So omega B, it's uh, the B is the polynomial, it's, it's the coordinate ring of Z. And uh, it takes a P minus one form over B and it maps to an element of this quotient um, in the following way. You just take the wedge product of your um, omega with uh, DF zero over D uh, divided by F one sorry, df0 divided by f0, wedge df1 divided by f1. Okay, you can define this map. Um, it turns out that it's well-defined. And um, actually the residue map is kind of the inverse, but not on this level here, but on the cohomology level. Okay, how... <clears throat> How can we now um, really construct the residue map? For that, we need the completion of, a, of an algebra. The completion of, an al of the algebra A with respect to the ideal I is in general defined as the inverse limit of this uh, factor algebras A modulo I to the power of nu. Uh, but of course, this is a very abstract notion and you can um, describe it more explicitly um, in terms of power series here. So A, you take the formal power series of A with two indeterminates, T0, T1, and you mod out this ideal T0 minus F0, T1 minus F1. So in a way you plug in F0 for T0 and um, F1 for T1, and what you get is power series in F0, F1. But the problem is that those power series are not unique. So if, in particular, for instance, if you take just F0, which is of course an element of A, so you can um, represent it here just as a constant power series, so which is the first representation, F0 in, as an element of A, and then all other terms are zero. Or you can say, okay, it's actually represented by T0 and all other terms are zero. So if you write it in terms of F0, it's, it's like this. So it's two different power series representations for the same element in our com completion. But now there's a, there's a lemma of Grotendieck, which I still think uh, is kind of magic. There's a trick <laughs> or some construction which um, allows you to represent the elements of the completion 
by unique power series. So there's this um, ring isomorphism. So um, A hat is isomorphic to power series over B with two formal indeterminants T0, T1. So in the factor ring, um, if you use a factor ring as a coefficient, then it makes the representation unique. Now, if you, if you have that, if you have that isomorphism, you can do the following. Here on the left-hand side, you have the complex which describes the cohomology of W of our uh, open set. And then in the first step, you can uh, go over to power series or to this completion because you mod out the denominator here. It actually, uh, in, in each case, it, um, it, it makes um, our kind of, it, yeah, how, how should I say? From a certain index on the power series are actually then contained in the denominator and um, they need not uh, to be considered. So this is isomorphism, isomorphic, and then you use the isomorphism C hat here, and then you represent it uh, just here in terms of those power series. Of course, you have to localize then at T0, T1 here, for instance, or at T0 or at T1. Okay, now the idea is, the idea of the residue map is that you take an element of the, numerator here, so the powers, um, an, a form with coefficients, power series with denominators T0, T1. You expand it in the usual form, it's a power series, and then you take the coefficient of this term, T, uh, D T0 divided by T0 hat D T1 divided by T1. Remember the, um, the map lambda, which we have described before, were more or less the wedge product with this, uh, where you identify T0 with F0 and T1 with F. Okay, the, now the, what I call effective Grotendieck magic, um, it's the lemma of, of uh, Grotendieck, which allows to construct this isomorphism C hat. And this, that is um, actually a stepwise process where you start with um, the algebra B and then you lift it um, to factor algebras um, where you have powers of this ideal modded out. So this is the basic construction of one of the steps. If you have um, a homomorphism of B into A mod I to the power of N, then you can lift it to a homomorphism into A to the power A divided by I to the power of N plus one, uh, so that this diagram commutes. Okay, here, this is really the plain uh, lemma of Grotendieck. I have not now um, stated any degree bounds, you really have to go into the proof of it um, or into a constructive proof with, to, to get degree bounds. But that's how you apply it. Uh, you start with the identity. So B is our factoring um, and it maps identically to A mod I. And then you lift it to Psi one, uh, Psi two here, A, uh, mod i squared and so on. And taking all these c's together, they define a homomorphism into the completion of A. Now that if you go through the proof of uh, this lifting to the, if you really construct um, these things, then you can um, get a degree bound for c. Uh, which is um, denoted like this. 
if I take the variables, the, the, so the classes of the variables here, the variable function, coordinate functions, and you map it, then they are represented uh, by power series and they, uh, those power series can be chosen so that the, the coefficients have um, satisfied those, this degree bounds. Okay. Then um, we want to define D hat. In order to do that, uh, we look at this um, exact sequence. So you have the, the ideal, the completion of the ideal in, in the completion of A. Um, it um, embeds into A hat and then it projects to B. So B as well is A hat mod I hat. So this means, and this um, splits by this homomorphism, which we have just uh, described. So that means A hat is actually a direct sum of B and I hat um, with using here this, um, this, this homomorphism C. And this means that each A in the completion can be uniquely written as, as Psi of B some b with uh, plus some element in the ideal. And now we can use the psi to really um, define this um, homomorphism where we um, take a formal power series over b and map the b's, the coefficients, uh, into a hat using this um, psi. And um, forming the power, corresponding power series in the completion. And this is then the, the isomorphism C hat. Okay, um, this is what I wanted to, to give you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for now. There's time for questions, I think. Uh, thank you, Peter. Any question? So we have a couple of minutes for questions, discussion. Uh, yeah, maybe I can ask. So are there any applications of this degree bound for the for these representatives? Uh, I understand that it is kind of a step towards effective uh, computation, but yeah. Well, actually, uh, the simple or the short answer is I don't know. Um, so far, if there but are this Yakovenko stuff. Uh... Yeah, actually, also I don't know if he has done something with it in the meantime. I mean, um, he just told me that. Um, probably already quite uh, more restricted um, settings would be sufficient for, for his purposes. Um, but um, actually maybe, I don't know, I've, I've uh, not heard of any progress in, in his work. So I don't know. And uh, is there any progress on the other side, this bounds for the exact uh, forms? Yeah, also there, I, I don't know, but I really think there is no, no progress yet. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. I haven't worked on it um, because I'm um, concerned with, with really more applied stuff and, um, and I'm not aware of any other people working on that. So are there any other questions? Well, if uh, there are no other questions, then let's thank Peter again. It's very nice to see him after a long time. Thank you.
and thank you all for uh, attending the, our session. So that was actually the last uh, presentation of this seminar and hopefully we see you uh, sometimes in future. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.